We're excited to be presenting on this session. Today's session is going to be about the behavioral economics of online platforms. Uh, and for the presenters here and for a whole bunch of other researchers, uh, this is an exciting topic. Um, over the last 20 years, pretty much every uh, decision that we make in the world around us is being affected by online platforms, from where we shop, to the hotels that we book, the restaurants we go to, uh, and the way that we find facts. Uh, so today, the way that we're going to be structuring this is thinking about all the different touch points uh, that are affected by online platforms. And we're going to have three different perspectives. First, we're going to have uh, Ginger Jin, who is the director of the Bureau of Economics and a professor of economics at University of Maryland, who is going to be giving a view from the FTC about uh, regulation of online platforms and more generally about the role of behavioral economics uh, at FTC. Then we're going to have Alessandro Acquisti, who's going to be focusing on uh, the consumer perspective and how users are affected by online platforms. Um, and then I'm going to be presenting some work about the designers of online marketplaces and how the choices that they make when designing a platform affect uh, the, the outcomes of users in a myriad ways. Uh, the way that we're going to structure this is we're going to have about 15 to 20 minutes for each presenter, and then we're going to save some time at the end uh, for questions for all the different speakers. So uh, without further ado, uh, Ginger. Thank you so much. Thank you for coming. Um, this is an exciting error about information. Uh, I have written something about information economics, but I wouldn't claim myself to be a behavioral economist yet. Okay, <laughs> I haven't um, received formal training in behavioral economics, so my knowledge in this area is more of my own reading plus nudges from co-authors like Mike Luca. Um, so um, as the Director of Bureau of Economics at the Federal Trade Commission, I have to put a disclaimer here, views expressed here, just my own, not of the commission or individual commissioners. I only be at this position for five months, but what I have seen at FTC is really eye-opening. So I really, um, thanks for the opportunity to express what FTC is doing, especially on the front of behavioral economics, as well as online activities. So in case you haven't heard about Federal Trade Commission before today, okay, I think most salient way of describing Federal Trade Commission is probably by a picture. This is a statue in front of the headquarter of Federal Trade Commission. It describes, if you're thinking the market is a horse that's energetic, dynamic, and sometimes even sinister, then FTC is sort of the man trying to control this trade and hopefully guide the trade. Um, FTC has been established by President Woodrow Wilson in 1914, so the agency is over 100 years old. According to the 1914 Federal Trade Commission Act, we're charged to do two functions. One is law enforcement. We um, have the authority to go after business practices that we believe are anti-competitive, deceptive, or unfair. As of today, we actually enforce over 60 laws, including the Federal Trade Commission Act, the Sherman Act, Clayton Act, and so forth. Okay, so that's one function of Federal Trade Commission. Another function, which I would argue is equally important, is we try to be an important voice of policy. Um, the agency was started to um, was started in 1914 as sort of a research entity that we try to provide research about industries and therefore they, um, the law actually give us authority to subpoena for data, okay, which is quite powerful tool. Um, so throughout the 100 years we produce a lot of research report. I'm going to touch on sort of more recent research report we have written about um, online activities. We also engage in rulemaking for um, many industries. Um, on a day-to-day -day basis, we provide policy advocacy to, say, Congress legislation, to state governments, to private litigation, and to many entities that um, we think our voice would be helpful. Okay, so that's the main function of Federal Trade Commission. Um, Within the Federal Trade Commission, by definition, you were thinking, okay, this is everything about law, okay? It's also everything about economics. So um, within the commission, we have a Bureau of Economics. We actually have over 80 PhD economists, all in applied micro, okay? Plus 30 years financial analysts, research analysts, as well as administrative people. So 
in the Bureau of Economics, we work with lawyers very closely on both competition and consumer protection. Okay. However, we're supposed to provide independent voice to the commission. So the economics perspective sometimes can be different from the legal perspective, and I will argue you many times, they're actually very complementary. Okay, so we, we work with lawyers, but we provide independent voice to the commission. Okay, so <coughs> I guess this question may be in all of your mind. How could behavioral economics matter for our business? Okay, why would this matter for antitrust or consumer protection? It turns out that we are concerned of a lot of behavioral problems. For example, some consumers may behave irrationally. Okay, they just say trust the advertisement on the face value. They fail to recognize some information has been omitted. Okay, and they sort of ends up making mistakes and somebody may argue that they need some protection against making those mistakes. And then on the supply side, some firms may recognize the naivete of consumers and try to design contracts to take advantage of that, right? For example, if we pay more attention to big funds than to small funds, maybe the company would have incentive to put all the unfavorable terms in the fine prints, okay? If we have time inconsistency in our preferences, maybe firms would compete to give us really teaser rate for today's contract, but batted a lot of things for future charges and so forth. So as the um, agency charged to protect consumers were, would be concerned about those kind of practices. On the other hand, we may argue, okay, bounded rationality is not limited to consumers. Maybe firms are subject to bounded rationality as well. For example, if managers of big firms want to merge, not because they want to, say, gain monopoly power, but want to build their empire or because they're overconfident and they're more risk taking, then the model we use to predict the merger effects, which is based on the full rational model most of the time, that may be questionable, right? We will ask ourselves, okay, if we factor in those behavioral potentials, would the prediction be different, be different and how much should we adjust our merger um, policy on that? And lastly, policymakers, including us, are unfollowable to bounded rationality as well. If we as an agency have inconsistency problem over time, then maybe the policy that looks good today may not look good tomorrow, right? We need to take all that into account. But one cautionary note is that recognizing a behavioral concern does not necessarily imply policy interventions, okay? For one thing, we're probably not smarter than average consumers, okay? Um, actually, more importantly, consumers may learn from their own mistakes, okay? So it's not clear that we recognize a behavioral bias today. That means we have a policy addressing that, but consumers may be away from that already because of their self-learning, okay? And also, thanks to researchers like you, I have seen a lot of fascinating topics um, yesterday that researchers actually help the market or help the firm to recognize behavioral bias and try to nudge the consumers to make a better decision. So the market probably is playing a very active role in addressing those behavioral um, problem if we think that's a problem. And therefore, when we think about policy intervention, we have to take into account how market is addressing this and how fast the market can recognize the problem and correct it, okay? So at the end of the day, we come back to this benefit cost analysis principle that we have to evaluate the benefits and the cost of different options, including keeping the status quo, okay? So, um, for how many minutes I have? 15 minutes or something? Um, I was just going to introduce you some FTC activities related to behavioral economics, including economic research, as well as the conferences and the workshops we have organized or will organize in the near future. I'm gonna to touch on the FTC standard and, and how it's related to online business practices, and I will end with some remaining questions. So um, just give you some example. FTC actually has been quietly um, quite deeply involved in gathering information about fraud, okay? So we have conducted three rounds of nationwide fraud surveys in 2003, 2005, 2011, and the fourth one is ongoing for 2016. So I'm quoting the citation here, you can Google them, you can see the full report. Um, just to give you some 
highlights in the most recent fraud survey as of 2011, we find about 10.8% of US adults, or in other words, like 25.6 million people were fraud victims. Okay, this is self-reported fraud victims. And in total, we estimate there are about 37.8 million incidents of fraud during 2011. And I don't know whether those numbers strike you as big or small, but it's sort of alarming to me. And if you're interested in see what's the most popular frauds in 2011, okay, um, number one is actually weight loss products. So we estimate there are over five million Victims fall into um, weight loss products, followed by um, price promotion, billing problems in both Buyers Club and Internet services, and so forth. Okay, and these are just sort of the top ones. They're actually a very, very long tail of different kinds of frauds and and so forth. And then, I guess we're all behavioral interested in behavioral um, explanations. So we have a follow-up study try to figure out, okay, who is susceptible to fraud, okay? So um, I'm quoting a working paper by staff in our um, bureau. The working paper is, again, Googleable on, on the internet, okay? Um, in this study, we um, designed a lab experiment run at George Mason University, involved about 254 human subjects. We asked subjects to give credibility rating to sample ads, okay? Um, actually, some ads are plausible according to uh, our official analysis. Some ads are not uh, sort of basically too good to be true. I'm going to show you examples and see how you think those ads are credible or not. Okay, we're going to have a show of hands of whether you think those um, ads are credible. And then the study also measures subjects' behavioral factors, such as how overconfident they are, how much uh, numeracy they have, and so forth. So we're going to associate those factors with their credible rating. Okay, are you ready? I'm going to show you um, some ads, and we'll see uh, whether you think they're credible or not. Okay, so this is ads about um, diet plan. Okay, I'm going to give you one minute to read. Okay, how many of you think this ad is credible? Okay, I only see a few. Five, okay. Wow, you're quite critical, okay. Let's see the other ad, okay, uh, which is very similar. <laughs> Now let's have a show of hands again. How many of you think this is credible? <laughs> Anyone? Okay, it turns out the first one will be designated as plausible ad, and the second one will be too good to be true because the science has not been there to enable anyone to lose up to 10 pounds per week, okay, in a sustainable way, okay? Um, so in our study, we basically um, sort of say, okay, we have the credibility rating from each subject. We link those to the kind of behavioral factors we find. So this is kind of the correlation. Okay, we're not claiming causal effect here. This is a correlation. Who finds plausible as credible? It's those who have higher numeracy, more overconfident, less impulsivity, and a less skeptic. Okay, that sort of makes sense. Let's also see the other. The other side, who rates impossible as credible, okay? Well, these are, tends to be less educated people, less skepticism, but still, <laughs> for example, the more, oh, I'm sorry, the um, overconfident people appear on both sides, okay? Which is a little surprising to me. I think what this gives me is that it's sort of hard to really pin down exactly what kind of behavioral factor will be linked to the sort of the behavior we uh, really care about, okay? I think this is uh, um <coughs> probably means that we need to be very careful when we try to think about who we want to protect and how we want to protect them, okay? So um, another example is uh, our staff have written a series paper about mortgage disclosure and they do this by in-depth consumer interviews. They also, in the control the lab experiment, try to test how people comprehend the current disclosure form of mortgage loans versus a um, prototype disclosure form. Okay, so what they find, for example, in the 2004 study, when 
the form disclose broker compensation in the form is actually backfires. It's create a significant proportion to choose wrong and more expensive plans. It also make consumer biased against the broker loan, even if the total cost of broker loan might be lower than the total cost of non-broker loan. Okay, in 2007, they sort of continue um, the same line. They try to test people's understanding of different forms of disclosure. One finding sort of unsurprising to me is that we find people misunderstand. I, mean, I guess this crowd probably not surprised to find that, but actually that misunderstanding apply to both prime lenders and, and prime borrowers um, and also subprime borrowers, okay? It applies to those who do not search at all and also to those who have extensively searched, okay? So this is sort of saying that we really have to be careful in using disclosure tools. We just not say that's, okay, let's give more information to consumers, assuming they will be able to um, understand those. It's the form, the frame, the exact uh, way we present them actually could matter, okay? Um, these are the past FTC conferences. Actually, for all conferences, I think we have a um, video um, uploaded on our website. You can check those out if you want to sort of sit through the workshop um, <coughs> remotely. That will be, um, be fine. Uh, we also have some forthcoming conferences. In September 15th, we're going to have a workshop to test the effectiveness of consumer disclosures. The day right after, we're going to have a joint conference with Marketing Science, touching on um, a lot of topics with marketing. In November, we're going to have our annual conferences. Okay, um, so you're welcome to submit papers to all those conferences. Um, just with the five minutes, let me touch on sort of what's the legal standard we use at FTC and how that relates to online activities. Um, for consumer protection, we sort of have two major legal standards. One is so-called the deception policy statement and the other is unfair. So you can see here, I sort of write the exact word of the statement here. Um, I, highlight, I highlight the sort of targeted consumers we want to protect, okay? So in the deception policy, we're sort of saying that we want to um, go after the practice that's, oh, whoops, what happens? Um, <laughs> we want to go after the practice that's likely to mislead consumers acting reasonably in the circumstances, okay? Actually, the standard before this was more leaning towards protecting consumers that's um, ignorant, unthinking, credulous, okay? And this statement tried to sort of say we emphasize reasonable consumers because it might be um, over deterrence to blame a firm to be, um, to be accountable for like very outlier misunderstanding of, um, of a statement, okay? And for the unfairness, same similarly, we sort of saying that we want to go after the um, activities that have substantial injury and not avoidable by reasonable consumers. Okay, so you can see in both standards, we sort of emphasize this reasonable consumers as the main body of consumers. We try to, um, yes. No, 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 that's a very good question. Actually, um, the legal interpretation was like reasonable is ordinary is even not necessarily implied. They must be highly educated um, and so on. And in the deception, in the deceptive re statement, we actually emphasize that we understand some advertising may have a targeted audience, say target children or target elderly or target the sick, and we would sort of use our statement for that targeted audience. Okay. Okay, so we actually have a lot of tools. Um, I give you some example here is ranging from sort of really paternal uh, list tech that's we ban certain choices or uh, we sort of just nudge you towards the right choices or inform you without any judgment and so forth. However, all these are sort of easy said than done. For example, how do we know what is wrong choice and what is right choice? And maybe different people may have different view on what's wrong and what's right, okay? And when we give people information, people may misunderstand it and so forth, okay? So let me give you, um, a few words about online practices, okay? So um, I try to do this in one slide, <laughs> okay? Um, traditionally, before the internet era, you will see, okay, firms deliver information to consumers, okay? Through advertising, through contract, and so forth, so we go after them if the practice turns out to be deceptive or unfair. But with the online, the communication is sort of both sides, right? We can use new tools like .com or Twitter or other things to inform consumers. 
well, consumers can endorse the product as well in the other direction. So we actually have published dot com disclosure guideline and endorsement guideline to emphasize that the same principle, be clear, be conspicuous in your disclosure, apply to the online activities as well. And at the bottom, I highlight the privacy and data security issue. Um, I know Alexandra is going to is going to talk more about the privacy, but um, FTC have involved a lot of activities in those areas. Since 2003, we have the Do Not Call Registry. Um, we have um, the FTC Privacy Report in 2012. We settled with Google in 2012 um, for um, their alleged tracking of um, browser users in Safari. Um, we have a settlement of 100 million with LifeLock accusing them of um, not maintaining and establishing a good data security measure and deceptively inform consumers that they're going to produce um, tracking of potential identity theft um, inquiries, but they claim they do this immediately, but actually turns out not as immediate as they claim. Okay, we also have settlement with Wyndham Hotel, um, pushing them to have better data security measures because um, they expose consumers' personal information to a great risk through three data breaches. Okay, and there are also some online, um, well, platform is a key word here, um, which enables some online reviews. It's not no longer just firm to consumer communication, but also consumer to consumer um, communication. Okay, so we have gone after some cases there. For example, we sued, I think last year we sued a company called Roca Lab, which is a Florida based weight loss product um, company. They actually have the terms of condition, including a gag cost, basically saying that if you write negative reviews of my product, then um, we, we may sue you or you may have to pay for the product with much higher price and so forth. We think that's unfair practice, okay? We also go after um, Sony and um, its ad agency, Deutsch, because um, the ad agency manager wrote an email, encouraged their employees to tweet about the product of Sony. I think this is a PlayStation um, game counselor to trick about the product without disclosing that they actually um, have a financial relationship with Sony. And similarly, Machina is a entertainment company that uh, produces videos for advertising of uh, Microsoft Xbox One. And we um, settle with them because we think um, they have paid several um, web influencers to tout about a product without disclosing their relationship with um, the company. And finally, on um, firm to firm relationship, we have, uh, we're concerned about data sharing. Okay, I took everybody in this room probably concerned about data sharing as well. Okay, time up. Okay, I'm gonna get negative one minute. Um, so um, <laughs> FTC actually has published a lot of report. We have published study on data brokers in 2014. We published a report on internet things. We published a report on big data. So all these are not casework, but it's more sort of research oriented, policy oriented, try to give guidelines and give a uh, recommendation to the market. Okay, so um, I'm going to sort of end here with some big questions like, is be behavioral economics a game changer or it's just something that's make the edge a little fuzzier, but still we should use the neoclassical economics, okay? I'm gonna leave those questions to you. And then the question is, who should we pr protect? There are heterogeneity of consumers. There are also spill over between the naive and the sophisticated consumers. How we take those into account in our policy and how we protect it. Should we sort of educate consumers so that they become more sophisticated or we go after the firms so that they would not take advantage of uh, naive consumers? So I'm going to leave those um, questions to you um, with the last question of how we try to regulate in an evolving market just because consumers preferences changing, firms activity is changing with the consumer preference, all these probably change with how regulators think about it. I think this will be a, a segue to Alexandra's study. Um, privacy, thank you. Thank you and good morning. I'm, I, I am indeed going to talk about how um, behavior economics as well as economics can uh, help us understand the way online platforms uh, affect um, individual behavior online and, and the consequences of uh, um, the, the changes in behavior they may um, affect. Um, 
it's it's an area it's it, it's really fun to be working in this area right now because it's uh, both from a research perspective and from a policy perspective much is going on um, there is uh, much hope on the uh, possibility of gathering data and using analytics uh, to improve the world um, this hope sometimes almost sounds like propaganda. In fact, not every uh, one would agree, um, including <laughs> noted uh, <laughs> behavior economist and nudger Samuel L. Jackson. Um, there is also lots of debate on the um, issue regarding whether consumers actually do care for privacy or not. In surveys, consumers claim that privacy is important. In behavior, well, we are all spending time on Twitter and Facebook revealing very sensitive information to strangers. So some have even suggested privacy may be a modern anomaly. <coughs> we didn't have privacy when we were, you know, hundreds of thousands of years ago. Our ancestors lived as allegedly in a world without privacy. And then with the Industrial Revolution, we started having maybe two or three, two centuries of privacy, and now that we are constantly being monitored online on, for everything we do, well, that's a uh, return to the normal state of mankind. Well, the, I don't actually agree with this argument, but I find it interesting how the argument does not reflect the fact that online platforms are designed in order to induce you to spend more time using services and reveal more information. And uh, in the last few years, I and others have done work in this area. Um, Leslie John here, who is a professor at HPS, has done lots of work in this area. Uh, myself, I'm going to show you some of the results, uh, both from lab experiments as well as, as from field data we have accumulated through the years. And this is an um, observation, not a study per se, it's more of an observation of how the default settings on Facebook have changed from uh, Almost the inception, 2005, not exactly the inception because Facebook started right here, right? 2004. But 2005 is close enough to the birth date. And uh, uh, between 2005 and 2014, what you have there, I don't know if you can see in uh, the uh, text on the screen, uh, what fields uh, such as names, birth date, friends, uh, were, were visible to whom? Um, at the time, by default. So if you provided that information, whether well, it would be visible to your friends, to Facebook, to, an entire, uh, to other Facebook users, or to the entire internet. That was in 2005. By 2014, you can see that by default, much more information was uh, visible to many more people. And these changes in defaults do have an effect on uh, eventually how many people will uh, get information about you. Um, another um, chart, this is from a study we started in um, 2005. Uh, when Facebook started the CMU a few months after it started here at Harvard, we started creating accounts on the uh, Carnegie Mellon Facebook network, and we wrote scripts, probably at the time we were using PHP, um, to mine from those profiles what other profiles were publicly revealing to everyone on the Carnegie Mellon Facebook network. And we kept doing that over time. So what you can see here over time from 2005 until 2011, the percentage of profiles on the Carnegie Mellon Facebook network were openly and publicly revealing information such as birthday. What you can see is over time is a pretty obvious trend of less and less open disclosure uh, due to a combination of people, some people removing that information so they no longer provide it, not even, uh, not even to Facebook, or some people changing the privacy settings to reveal less publicly, okay? The second chart shows uh, a different field, not birthday, but high school. And you see there is a subtle but pretty important difference in uh, 2010, you notice? So what happened in 2010? Was it the case that some people, uh, from 20% to 40%, so a double in the um, uh, willingness of, um, of, um, of uh, um, um, CMU Facebook users at the time to reveal their high school, suddenly they want to reveal more, or in fact Facebook at the time uh, changed the default settings to make birthday, uh, sorry, high school information publicly available by default, but not birthday. So this is an example, I like this chart because it shows both the, what I could say, the endogenous preferences, people are trying to reveal less publicly, but the fact, the exogenous, exogenous effect, the shock into the system caused by changes in a, a user interface. So 
if we do then believe that these exogenous shocks can nudge people into your revealing more or less, and people lose control of their press information, what kind of tools do we have to make the game fair? Well, the typical tool of policy making has been in the last few years notice and consent or transparency and control. I happen to believe that these are useful tools, but I like to call them necessary, not sufficient conditions for privacy protection. They are necessary because, well, it's fair to tell people how you use their data. It is fair to give them some degree of control over how you will use their data. Sadly, or unfortunately, it's not sufficient because there are so many ways in which you can make the transparency <coughs> tool ineffective or you can even make the control tool backfire. Let me give you two examples about transparency first. In a study about transparency, we wanted to see for how long information you give people about how their data will be used will remain salient in the decision making. I stress salient, so it's not about forgetting what people are told in a privacy policy about how their data will be used, it's whether they will pay attention to this information given to them when they decide whether to disclose or not. So we had an incoming class of CMU students and we asked them to participate in a survey. The survey included questions which are not particularly sensitive, which courses are you planning to take, and sensitive ones such as have you ever plagiarized some material for an exam, uh, have you ever cheated in, uh, in coursework. One group of students were told that other students would see the answers to this survey. Another group of students were told the students and faculty members would see the answers to this survey. We of course expected that given this, uh, you could call it a privacy notice. It was a form of transparency. We were telling people how their answers will be used. So we were expected that given this uh, notice, uh, subjects in the first condition will be more likely to provide answers to the question of the subjects in the second condition. And that was exactly the case. There was a statistical significant difference in the response rates, and the difference was due specifically to the most sensitive questions. So the group told that also faculty would, dis would see their answers were so less likely to feel comfortable answering questions about cheating, plagiarizing, and so forth. So far, so good. So if you stop, if I stop the talk here and I leave, or if you leave, then uh, you would remember that notices work. People react in some somewhat rational manner way to um, notice information and transparency. But in fact, that was not what the experiment was only about. We actually had two other experimental conditions in which we repeated exac exactly the same steps, only that now, between the moment we told the subjects how we will use their data, so your answers will be seen by students, or students and faculty. And the moment we actually started asking them the questions, we inserted a delay. And the delay was, if you remember using the internet in circa 2000, 2001, the early days, there would be a bar slowly loading until the page is ready for you. And that was the delay we put. And my question for you is, how long do you think we had to put a delay for in order to nullify the somewhat inhibitory effect of knowing that faculty members may see the answers to your questionnaire. And by nullify, again, I don't mean f making people forget because we have exit questions, manipulation checks at the end, uh, to be sure that it's not about forgetting. It's about uh, the saliency of the um, recipient information no longer being there for the second group. Five minutes, two minutes, <laughs> one minute. How about 15 seconds? So we tried 15 seconds initially just in a pilot, and it worked. It completely nullified the difference between the two groups. We didn't believe it, so we repeated it with a larger scale. We still find it. Then we tried to do something different. So rather than de a delay, inserting a uh, irrelevant question, such as, would you like to join this mailing list for campus? Same effect. It just changes the status of information, changes uh, the, nullify the inhibitory effect of knowing that faculty members will see your answers. About control, for those of you who are not in the privacy scholarship, I have to tell you that control is seen as a critical aspect of privacy protection. Sometimes, in fact, privacy is defined as control over personal information. So there is a monotonic positive relationship between control and privacy. We conjectured that actually things could be negative in the sense that perhaps more control could paradoxically lead to people taking 
more risk with the personal information through a phenomenon comparable to studies in the 1970s on how, um, for instance, asking people to wear seat belts may lead them to actually drive faster because they may become overconfident. So we wanted to test a similar analogous um, uh, process in the case of privacy, and we did a survey. This one was not done with students. This one was done online. Uh, we asked people to uh, answer very simple yes, no questions. Uh, some were non-sensitive. Have you ever been married? Some were particularly sensitive. Have you used uh, drugs of a certain type? And the people, the participants were told that they were not forced to answer the question. They could skip the questions that they did not want to answer. In another experimental condition, however, we added a little checkbox. I, again, I don't know whether you can read the text. The checkbox reads uh, publication permission. So we told them, and by the way, I forgot to mention that even in the previous condition, subjects were told you don't need to answer, but if you do answer, we're going to publish your answers, okay? In this group, they were also told you don't need to answer, but in order to give us the permission to publish your answer, you would have to check the box. So we were basically invoking the agency of the participants to make them feel more in control, because now they are the ones who are actually physically checking the box and therefore granting us the ability to publish. That ability, in fact, existed also in the first condition, but it was implicit. Here we are making it explicit. Now, status quo bias may suggest that people will not bother checking the box, also because it means more disclosure of more sensitive information to more people, we conjecture the very opposite, that by making people feel more in control, we would end up making them disclose more. And this is exactly what happened. Here I'm focusing on the sensitive question, not, not the non-sensitive. For the sensitive questions, we are able to nearly double the probability the subjects in this questionnaire will answer the questions and then will uh, indeed allow them to be published. Because this is not just response rates, response and publication rates. So the subjects did check the box allowing publication. Now, does it matter? Meaning, the, the one beautiful slide in Ginger's um, uh, presentation was, okay, there are biases. What do we do about that? And should we do anything about that? Because uh, maybe it doesn't matter. Maybe the more you disclose, the better targeted offers you get. So part of my work with more of a economics hat on, uh, on, uh, on it, and sometimes more of a data mining hat on it, is about what are the consequences of these information disclosures. I'll give you two examples. The first one is about uh, non-economic consequences, but practical ones nevertheless. The second, economic consequences. The non-economic consequences are the following. Once you reveal enough information about yourself, even non-sensitive one, it becomes increasingly easy, or at least increasingly possible, for other people to infer extremely sensitive information about you, meaning, you can start from non-sensitive data. You can even start from anonymous data. And because of the progress in data mining, it is more and more the case that you can end up identifying individuals and finding sensitive information about them. In a study we did a few years ago at CMU, we took pictures of students walking on a campus building. This is the foyer in the Heinz College where I teach. And we asked them to participate in a survey. If they agree to participate in the survey, they set on the foyer, in a, the table in the foyer, and they started filling out a survey on a laptop that we had prepared for them. Meanwhile, we had uploaded uh, this shot that we had taken of them with a webcam to the cloud. On the cloud, we had previously downloaded images from uh, the Carnegie Mellon Facebook network. So we have downloaded profile images from mainly CMU students. And we ran a facial recognition program in real time to see whether we could find matches between the student uh, webcam shot and the Facebook profiles. By the time the subject the experiment reached the last page of this uh, survey that they were filling out on the laptop, because the, the, we asked them to fill out the survey, two, three pages, it would take about three, four minutes. By the time they reached the last page, that last page had been dynamically updated with the 10 best matching photos which the recognizer had found on the cloud, and the subject was asked to <laughs> indicate whether he or she uh, found himself or herself in any of those photos. Can you find the subject here? It's, uh, well, the recognizer, which was Pete Pat, did find him there in the back. Quite remarkable, considering um, the difference in facial hair, 
between uh, between the different years uh, the, 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 when the, the Facebook photo was uploaded and the four year photo was taken as well let's considering that the subject was in the background the lower resolution photo and by the way we did the study in 2000 well we published in 2014 but the study was done in 2011 the speed at which facial recognizers are getting better every year is uh, pretty outstanding so now the accuracy would be way way better so anyhow, we found, uh, we recognize meaning. We found Facebook profiles for one out of three subjects in this experiment. But then we decided to make things even more interesting because a few years earlier, in 2009, we published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Science a study showing that we could take demographic data from people who are alive on Facebook. We can find people's birthday and uh, uh, hometown so therefore the state of birth. We could statistically combine it with data from the Social Security Death Index or um, death master file, which is a database of the social security numbers of all people who are dead. And by using, kind of interpolating the SSN of people who are dead with the demographic or people who are alive, we could end up predicting the social security numbers of people who are alive, okay? Which in the US is extremely sensitive information. When I say predict, I mean, you know, this SSN is a nine digit number. So uh, it's not like with a single attempt, we'll get all nine digit numbers right. It it's more like if we add a brute force uh, attack with 100 attempt, what is the probability that we can get to this person SSN, okay? And we could for certain states with high accuracy. So do you see where I'm going with this? The two studies together? So if you combine the two studies together, the story becomes, can you start from an anonymous face online or in the street? Using facial recognition and social media data, you give a name to that face. From the name, you can find publicly available information, which is considered non-sensitive. Demographic data such as date of birth and state of birth. But from this non-sensitive information, you can end up predicting social security numbers, which is exactly what we did in the final experiment. And we showed that as a proof of concept, we could predict part of the SSN starting from a face. If I were an identity thief, I would never use it, uh, this approach for my business because it's not accurate enough. But as a proof of concept, it's particularly powerful because it tells a broader story of how, because of the data we are making publicly available, we can start from something anonymous, unidentified, combined with something non-sensitive, and end up with something extremely sensitive and identified. So w why does it matter? That could be a potential answer for some of you. The second answer for others of you is the economic answer. So in the last few years, in the debate over privacy, there have been a number of claims made. You can find them both in the academic literature and sometimes among practitioners, uh, and especially from the data industry. Uh, sharing personal data is an econ economic win-win. Market forces lead to everyone benefiting from the sharing of data. Personal information is the lifeblood of the internet. If we take away data from internet, if we protect even a little bit more privacy, you no longer get Facebook, you no longer get uh, free services, uh, you no longer get free news, and your times, and so forth. And finally, the loss of privacy is indeed the price to pay for big data, which is a variant of the previous claim. Now, it so happens that we just published, literally came out yesterday, in GEL, the Journal of Economic Literature, a review of the privacy economics literature, which took us about 10 years to write. And therefore, we could challenge, uh, well, we could investigate these claims. It turns out that for at least one of them, we know that the answer is absolutely no, it's, that's not the case. Sharing data creates winners and losers. No doubt about that. Sometimes uh, winners and losers are the data subjects versus the data holders. So the data holder gets more data and can exploit this information versus data subjects. Sometimes the trade is between the data subjects. So uh, two people could uh, apply for a job and because information they publish, personal information they publish on Facebook, one may be more likely than the other to get a job. For the other two, we don't have a answer, but we have questions such as the, liter the literature suggests that these actually are open issues, which is pretty important. We actually don't know to what extent the more data is uh, obtained by platforms, the more free services or better services are provided versus the more profits the platforms make. In other words, we don't know enough about the allocation of surplus derived from data, which is, I believe, a very important issue. And I was mentioning these uh, reviews. So the, there are three reviews that we put out in the last year, one in science, one in jail, and one uh, actually still under review in, um, 
ACM surveys. Uh, if anyone is, is interested, these are the references. The first is very short, it's just a review of the behavioral literature on privacy. The second is very long, it just came out yesterday. The third one is still under review, and it's about uh, how you can actually use software journalism to help people make better privacy and security decisions. Thank you very much. Okay, so I'm going to be talking today about designing online marketplaces, and I'm going to focus on uh, a specific set of design choices that are faced by online marketplaces uh, in housing markets. Uh, let me just motivate this a little bit by pointing out something that I think is obvious to everybody in this room, uh, which is that transactions have been increasingly moving online over the last decade or so. You can think about some of the early online platforms, such as eBay or Amazon, or some of the newer marketplaces, such as Relay Rides, Airbnb, Upwork, and we could all name a variety of others. In fact, if you think about Craigslist, uh, one of the early online marketplaces uh, at the time was uh, pretty anonymous transactions. Uh, you, here's just kind of a partial list of platforms that have started up uh, to try to facilitate the same transactions that Craigslist was doing. Yeah. And what I want to think about for a little while is the principles of designing an online marketplace. And when thinking about an online marketplace, there are essentially two flavors of decisions that a market designer is making. Uh, first is they need to design a price mechanism. So in thinking about that, we can think about uh, auctions, fixed price, negotiation, uh, deciding literally the pricing mechanism that you're going to put into place in your online marketplace. Uh, and we could think about differences in that across different platforms. So eBay historically had been an auction, whereas Amazon historically had been more list price. eBay has been shifting over time. And we're starting to understand what types of marketplaces to different pricing systems make sense. Uh, but you could also think about constraints that you want to put on the market uh, in terms of what prices people might be allowed to charge. Uh, you can imagine setting price ceilings, price floors. Uh, for example, if you think about the online labor market Odesk, uh, the, the labor that had been going through there hadn't been subject to minimum wages the way that other labor, if you just hire somebody in your local labor market, would be subject to. Uh, so they decided to impose their own minimum wage of $3 per hour for employees, which turned out to be binding uh, for a lot of the jobs that are present on Odesk, which is now called Upwork. Uh, so thinking about that, that's kind of an example of a marketplace saying, okay, let's shift the wages that are going to be doing uh, and actually push up the wages for some non-trivial fraction of people. The second flavor of decision that online marketplaces make are about reputation mechanisms. So once you know the way that you want prices to be done, you need to decide what kinds of information are people going to have and how can you facilitate trust basically between, between strangers in a marketplace. And there are a few tools that have emerged in the last decade or so uh, that have become increasingly popular in online marketplaces. Uh, reviews is one part of it. Uh, product information where you just kind of go out and vet the specific item that somebody is trying to buy or sell is another part of it. And information about sellers and buyers is yet another part of it. And we're starting to understand what some of the principles are, are uh, behind all of these. And in fact, it's hard to imagine any online marketplace where you don't read reviews uh, about the product that you're buying or the person now that you're buying from. Um, and the main thing that I want to take away from this is just that the rules of the market are going to shape the outcomes that are on there. Um, it's going to determine who are the winners and the losers on the marketplace um, and whether you're going to be buyer friendly or seller friendly. Um, so what I want to do is kind of do a deep dive into one specific type of choice that online marketplaces have been making uh, and that has actually changed a lot over time, which is the level of anonymity. If we think about the early platforms that I mentioned, the Ebays and Amazons, they were actually pretty anonymous. They were arm's length transactions where you actually don't know a lot about the person that you're transacting with. Um, Priceline, Orbitz, all of this type of characteristic where uh, the transactions that we were making were actually more anonymous than we were uh, in offline transactions. Um, and there was a prediction that was made in the early uh, literature around this topic, which is that this should lead to less discrimination. 
And essentially, the prediction was that instead of having the opportunity to discriminate with somebody because you're seeing them face to face, now all you're doing is doing something through the internet, and you should see uh, all the price disparities, wage disparities start to go away. And kind of uh, an optimistic view of the internet. And actually, uh, my favorite paper on the topic is this Scott Morton and Zettelmeyer paper back in 2003, where they looked at car prices. And essentially, they compared car prices uh, for people who are buying cars offline to online, and saw that there's a lot of discrimination in offline marketplaces. But lots of this actually had gone away when they looked at uh, transactions that were mainly facilitated through the internet. Um, but they kind of treated this as a state, kind of the, OK, the transition is online marketplaces just are less anonymous kind of are more anonymous because they are. But actually, over time, there's been a pretty big shift in this. If we think about the internet back in 1993, um, this is kind of from a famous New Yorker cartoon that said, uh, on the internet, nobody knows you're a dog. And the kind of idea was you could go on and be whoever you want, and nobody is going to be any the wiser. But if we think about what the internet may be in 2015, when we were running this experiment, on Facebook, 273 people know I'm a dog, and the rest can only see my limited profile. Um, and as Alice had just said, uh, this is something that is shifting uh, over time, what exactly your limited profile means. Uh, so what I want to do is present these results, uh, thinking about whether, there's, whether it's still true that there's going to be less discrimination on the internet, or uh, is discrimination going to start popping up again in the types of online marketplaces that we're seeing now. So what we did is we ran a field experiment on Airbnb. Yeah, uh, and what we did is sent out about 6,400 requests for availability. So we looked across a series of cities and uh, sent out one message. The only thing that we varied in it uh, is the name of the guest. So we pulled these names from a series of audit studies that have been done primarily in uh, labor markets uh, that were designed to be either statistically uh, likely to be African American names or statistically likely to be white names, and used this variation to see what the difference in response rates would be on Airbnb, and then we could start to test the conditions under which there seems to be discrimination or no discrimination. Um, and finally, what we're able to do with this is combine this with a bunch of experimental data that we pulled directly off of the platform and that we merge in uh, from census data about the neighborhoods that people are uh, renting properties in. We can use this to do a few things. We could start to compare the, uh, cross-validate our experimental results uh, with the observational results that we see on the platform, and we could estimate the cost incurred by somebody who is discriminating. Uh, just to give a preview of the results to show where we're going, uh, guests with distinctively African-American names are about 15% uh, less likely to be accepted than somebody with a distinctively white name on Airbnb. And um, in contrast with what we had thought going in, actually the discrimination is pretty persistent. Um, it's persistent across the race of the host, the price of the listing, the heterogeneity of the neighborhood, whether it's kind of a predominantly white neighborhood or a predominantly African-American neighborhood. Uh, we see discrimination in all of these different situations. Um, and we're hoping that this will be kind of some guidance to how one might go about solving the problem, both from a legal perspective or from a market design perspective. Um, and actually, we find that hosts who reject somebody only has about a 35% chance of finding another guest. So actually, it does cost a fair bit of money if you're trying to discriminate uh, against somebody, an expected revenue loss of about $60. Uh, and finally, the experimental results that we have are basically mirroring the observational patterns um, to help cross-validate some of the things that we're seeing in our audit study. Uh, for people who don't know it, uh, Airbnb is a short-term marketplace. There's about 2 million active listings at any given time. Uh, if you compare that to Marriott, there's about 500,000 rooms at any given time. Uh, so it's kind of pretty large, even in its current state, and still rapidly growing. There have been about 40 million guests who have gone through Airbnb over time, um, and they have about $900 million revenue per year. Thinking about this, there's about a $25 billion valuation of Airbnb, making this uh, larger than any hotel chain uh, that's operating. Now, to put this into context a little bit, we could think about what's different in the internet than in the offline world. So there are three sets of players on a platform such as Airbnb. There are hosts, so these are the people that are posting the room, the apartment, they could rent out a property, uh, they could rent out just a room within their, within their property, uh, they set the price and they decide whether to accept or reject guests. You could see some things here that are exactly the same as the offline world. You have a hotel, uh, you have some flexibility about who to reject, but maybe different information about them, um, and you're setting the price. You've got guests who are doing what guests always do, which is searching for a room, um, and then you have this third party 
which is the new player that emerges in online marketplaces that is a lot less prominent um, in an offline market. It's a market designer. So in this case, it's Airbnb, who is setting rules that previously were kind of decentralized and just happening at uh, market level. Airbnb is allowing hosts and guests to find each other, deciding what's fair game and not fair game when building a reputation and facilitating payment. So to give an idea of what uh, searching on Airbnb looks like, uh, here is searching for a room around here. You could uh, look at a map, let's figure out whether you want to stay in an entire home or get a room within somebody else's house, and you'll get this listing of places around Harvard Square. You could see the picture of the person who would be your landlord, and you could see some pictures and reviews of the place you'll be staying. Uh, you could kind of dig down and see a bunch more information and options that you have. Um, and kind of not in this paper, uh, but another prediction of the economics of the internet is that we should have a lot more product variety. And that kind of bears out when you think about all the choices that you have on Airbnb. So here we could see perhaps some of the good things that are coming out of an online platform. Uh, and when you drill down on a place, you could see uh, more information about the host, you could see the reviews that have been left, and you could see all the other characteristics that are on here. So when thinking about this type of transaction, uh, what Airbnb does at the heart of the platform is they facilitate trust. If you were to ask investors, uh, why is it that Airbnb is so valuable, it's because they make a lot of design choices and make people feel comfortable transacting with each other. They verify information, they have these reviews, they have these profiles, and uh, importantly, they allow hosts to reject guests. In fact, over time, in response to complaints from hosts, they've made it easier to reject guests. So the experimental design, as I mentioned, essentially 6,400 requests. Uh, we inquired about availability two months out from the date at which we sent the request. We sent all of the requests out uh, automatically in a short period of time. Um, and we tracked whether people say yes, no, maybe, most people will say yes or no, and we found that maybe it basically didn't vary across the different conditions. Um, and then we tracked the, this other information. Uh, here are the cities we used. We basically picked five cities across the US, LA, DC, St. Louis, Dallas, and Baltimore. Um, and here are the results that we found. Overall, our acceptance rates were about 50%. So just to put this into context, 50% is ballpark, the amount of people who just say yes across Airbnb overall. So we were pretty comfortable with the messages we were sending uh, and the requests that we had out there. Um, and African-American guests were accepted about eight percentage points, which is about 15, 16% uh, less often uh, than white guests. So just to put this into context a little bit, suppose that you were to run the exact same experiment on Priceline or Orbitz. You would see no discrimination because there's no plausible way for hotels or Priceline or Orbitz to go about uh, discriminating against somebody based on a name, a picture, or other information you have about them. So this is very much kind of driven from a difference in the design choices made between a Priceline and an Airbnb. Uh, and as a market designer, it's pretty easy to see some of the choices that Airbnb does uh, to allow this to happen. So a second kind of data point that might help to put this into context is labor markets. So if we think about some of the offline audit studies that have been done, um, what they see is that there's roughly a 30% drop in callback rates uh, if you have an African-American sounding name relative to having a white sounding name. Uh, the base rates are lower, so if you wanted to just put our effect into context, um, it's larger in terms of percentage points and smaller in terms of uh, total percent. So ballpark, kind of, you might think it's comparable to the types of discrimination we've seen in offline marketplaces, but much larger than what we've seen in online marketplaces previously. Uh, so let me just take a minute and survey some of the other results that have been starting to pop up about discrimination in online marketplaces. There have been a series of studies now uh, that have started to look at data points around discrimination uh, in Airbnb, eBay, Craigslist, Upwork, Prosper, and other places. Uh, in credit markets, what people have shown uh, is that black borrowers are less likely to get funded for similar loan listings uh, than white borrowers. Uh, in Upwork, people have shown that the ethnicity of the person doing the hiring affects the ethnicity of the person that is getting hired. In Craigslist, buyers are less likely to contact somebody who is identifiably African American, um, and the way that they do that is a very kind of uh, the picture of the person who's holding the item that's for sale. eBay had a similar design and shown that uh, bids are lower for somebody who's identifiably African American. Um, versus somebody who's white using kind of the color of the skin of the person who's holding the item. 
So kind of across all these platforms, uh, there's kind of the general fact, which is that if you could identify the person, there's going to be uh, discrimination. Uh, but then there's variation in the extent to which these platforms uh, allow you to identify the person. So if you're on Craigslist or eBay, you sort of have to go to lengths to identify yourself by kind of sh literally uh, showing a picture of yourself in your listing, which is a little bit counter-normative. Uh, if you're Airbnb, um, you basically have to show information about yourself. Uh, who discriminates? Looking across this, we started thinking about the, whether this is driven uh, simply by homophily or is this actually uh, some sort of broader phenomenon on there. Um, I won't go too much into the, each data point here, but essentially what you can see is that discrimination is persistent generally across the race of the host, although there are some uh, race-gender interactions where uh, black females don't seem to be discriminating against black females. Uh, then we started thinking about some of the other attributes that might be moderating factors in a world of discrimination. We started thinking about uh, the size of the landlord. So some people have this view that the reason we see discrimination on Airbnb is because it's all kind of individuals like you or myself kind of listing out one single room in their place. Uh, so we looked at things like the number of listings. So it turns out that there's a growing number of property managers on Airbnb who have lots of listings that they're renting out and look just like regular hotels or bed and breakfasts that were rented out before them. Uh, we look at whether there's a shared unit or uh, an entire listing. So thinking about the distance between you and the person that you're renting out to. Um, and we found that discrimination is persistent across both of those. Uh, whether you have multiple listings or a single listing, whether you're renting out your whole place or kind of uh, just room your place, you still see that there's discrimination. We see that high volume and low volume guests both discriminate. Uh, uh, then we started thinking about kind of the characteristics of the property itself. Uh, some people thought that, oh, maybe this is just about the demographics of the neighborhood. Um, it's hard to identify kind of whether there's any difference across neighborhoods. But what we did here is just merged in census data and looked at the percent of people who are African American at the census tract level. Uh, and the likelihood of acceptance by the ethnicity of the, by the race of the name. And it kind of to a first approximation, it seems like there's discrimination all across the, uh, for all types of neighborhoods. Um, we also looked at the price of the listing, and basically for all prices, it seems like there's discrimination. It doesn't seem like there's any part of the price point, like kind of cheap places, expensive places, where discrimination just goes away. Uh, and as I mentioned, uh, does discrimination cost hosts? And there's a lot of the theoretical predictions in economics are that this depends on how thick the market is. If it's pretty easy to backfill your place, then you may not care about discriminating. So even if there's a low benefit of discriminating, you may just do it anyway. Uh, but Unlike offline audit studies, we were actually able to observe what happens to the property. So we were repeatedly tracked whether there's still availability on that date for the place, and that's how we figured out that there's only a 35% fill rate by the date that the uh, place actually um, is listed. So thinking about this, there does seem to be an economic cost of this. So basically, we see that there's persistent discrimination across race of hosts, experience in new hosts, shared and separate properties, expensive cheap properties, diverse and homogenous neighborhoods. So basically a very stubborn uh, effect. Um, and that hosts incur a cost to discriminate. Uh, we did see one bit of variation in where there is discrimination. We looked at the experimental and non-experimental uh, behavior, merged them together, and looked at the history of people who have stayed with somebody before. Um, we coded pictures of prior guests for whom there were pictures um, and looked at the reviews of hosts. And what we showed is that in the experimental data, if we break this down into, p into hosts who have never had an African-American guest before um, and hosts who had had at least one African-American uh, guest before, that behavior was very different. That the discrimination seemed to be concentrated among people who have never had an African-American guest, both helping to support the main fact, but also just helping to shed light on the nature of discrimination in the platform. So uh, this isn't just kind of everybody making the same decision, but kind of predictable discrimination across different subsets. Um, so since we worked on this paper, now we've been thinking about what are some of the things that you could do uh, to solve the problem. So if you were to kind of put on your hat as a choice architect or a market designer, uh, how should Airbnb be thinking about this or how might regulators be thinking about this? And there are a few choices that Airbnb has. One thing that they could do is control the information flow. So you can imagine the simplest solution to this would just be anonymize everything or at least kind of make race less salient. Um, you can imagine increasing instant booking. So rather than giving people lots of flexibility over whether to reject someone, um, 
give them a little bit less flexibility. Say, we'll give you some sort of a benefit if you just accept whoever satisfies some baseline criteria, like somebody um, who has a registered credit card and you know um, isn't going to bail without paying for the place. You can make the existing discrimination policies salient. Um, so thinking about how quickly uh, information and disclosure goes away, actually the time that a host sees the discrimination policies is basically when they're signing up. So at the point at which they're deciding who they should accept, uh, they probably don't think at all about some of the things that they agree to when first signing up to be a host. So you can imagine uh, basically plugging in something that every time you're making the decision as a host that you're going to uh, see the discrimination policies at this more relevant time, and that may be enough to reduce discrimination. Uh, we tried our own partial solution. We made a plugin that we call Debias Yourself, and we have a website for this called debiasyourself.org, and people could add this as an extension to their browser, and it anonymizes everything for you. And you can imagine that this is going to work in <laughs> some situations and not. So if it's a case that people are, um, are unconsciously biased and don't want to bias but fear that they may discriminate by seeing this, um, they so people may, uh, this would help to reduce the amount of bias kind of by reducing the information that they have. But you can imagine if people are willingly discriminating, then they just won't go and uh, add our extension. Um, so where this is right now is we've been in some talks with Airbnb, uh, thinking about some of the things we could do outside of Airbnb about reducing the amount of discrimination. So the kind of takeaways that we have from this are that online marketplaces are changing the world. So I wrote this paper essentially as a fan of online marketplaces and of Airbnb. But there are a bunch of market design challenges, and they go well beyond some of the early ones that economists had identified around pricing and things like that. Uh, there are a bunch of innocuous design choices that may have unintended consequences. Um, uh, obviously, nobody at Airbnb was thinking, let's facilitate discrimination. They were thinking, oh, that's a good place to stick a picture, and it just also facilitates discrimination. Uh, so when thinking about the lens that a market designer should have, it should be thinking about how do you maximize the value of your reputation system while minimizing some of these other unintended consequences. And in general, oh, my goal from this project is for people who are designing online marketplaces to think a little bit more like choice architects and think about what all of the consequences <laughs> intended and un unintended are for their platforms um, and think about that when deciding where to put things on the website. Thank you.